So in today's session, we'll continue with the chapter on diet in diseases of the kidney, diet and kidney diseases. It's on page number 446. Those who have the textbook, those who have the dietetics textbook, it's on page number 446. If anyone is joining late, please help them out with the page numbers. So we'll start today's session. First of all, just giving you a brief about the anatomy of the kidney. So you have two kidneys, right and left. A human body can function on one kidney as well. Okay. And both the kidneys have renal uh, vein and arteries entering and exiting from them. Okay. Renal artery will take the blood supply to the kidney. Renal vein will take the blood supply away from the kidney. Okay. And then if you do a dissection of kidney, these are the different parts present in the kidney. You don't have to study any of them. Okay, you have cortex and medulla. Uh, that is the main part of the kidney and renal pyramids. This is where all the urine that is formed in the uh, in the renal pyramids and in the uh, cortex of the kidney. This is where the nephrons are present. Okay, and when the urine is formed within the kidney, urine is collected through the collecting ducts, and then it it collects uh, it goes through the ureter and it gets collected in the urinary bladder, which is below. Okay, so this is the basic anatomy of the kidney. So kidneys are bean shaped in size, and they just sit just right above the waist on each side of our spinal col column, that is the vertebral column, and each kidney in a human body, in an adult human body, is the size of a fist, slightly smaller than the size of the fist. And the main responsibility of the kidney is to make sure that there is a homeostasis in the entire body. That is the pH level okay, of the fluids within the entire body is normal. So each kidney is composed of one million function unit, functional units called nephrons. Nephrons are the structural and functional unit of the kidney. Nephrons is where the filtration of the blood takes place. So this is how a nephron works like. Okay, if you can see, this is how the nephron works like this. Uh, every nephron has a Bowman's capsule. This top part which you see, Bowman's capsule. Within the Bowman's capsule is the glomerulus. Glomerulus is uh, is filled with, it's, it's a coiled form of uh, capillaries, blood capillaries, okay? So, uh, all the blood that is getting, uh, that all the blood that comes to the glomerulus will send, uh, will uh, put all the electrons uh, and electrolytes out of the blood into the filtrate, okay? And you can see here how the filtration takes place. So, but anything that is excess in the blood that has come into the glomerulus, all those electrolytes will be pushed out of the blood into the nephron, into the collecting ducts of the nephron. And what happens here is that even though the sodium, amino acids, glucose, okay, whatever is excess in the blood is getting filtered out of the blood, but still when it is going through this collecting system, when this sodium uh, amino acids and glucose is going is 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 getting transported out, uh, out of the glomerulus through towards the uh, ureters and etc. Collecting ducts and everything. At the same point, reabsorption is taking place. So kidneys do not allow the entire entirety of sodium, glucose, and amino acids to get lost in urine. In a health, if it is a healthy functioning kidney, it will what what will it do? reabsorption reabsorption means once the blood has dumped these uh, electrolytes and other essential items out of the blood but again kidneys are not allowing it to be filtered out kidneys are reabsorbing it back into the system okay so th through this filtrate through, through this collecting system uh, majority of the sodium glucose and amino acids are filtered back filtered uh, reabsorbed back into the blood capillaries and this blood capillaries will take this blood away from the kidney towards the rest of the body okay 
So this is how reabsorption takes place. And this is this is how a nephron looks like. It's just a diagrammatic representation of nephron. The real way how a nephron looks like is mentioned in your textbook on page number 446. You can see that. So globular, uh, globulus is the renal artery. Uh, it is the it is an extension of the blood capillaries coming out of the renal artery. Okay, because renal artery is the one that brings blood to the kidney for filtration. And this, uh, as soon as the blood from the artery reaches the glomerulus, whatever is access in amount is taken up by the kidney. Okay, uh, taken up taken up by the nephron, and it is essentially reabsorbed back into the system. Okay. And it is reabsorbed back into the venous system, not the arterial system. It is, it is, it is given up into the veins. Okay, The veins will take it back into the uh, other part of the body. Okay, So this is how reabsorption takes place. So the basic anatomy and physiology part of kidney is clear to all. Is it clear to all? Do you understand how the nephron works? How the kidneys function? How the, it looks like? One million nephrons are present within this area. More than one million nephrons. So you can understand at what rate the kidneys are filtering your blood out and forming urine, okay? Coming to the functions of kidneys. First main function is excretion of waste, okay? Urea, amino acid, ammonia, creatinine, creatinine phosphate, access drugs, okay? These, are, these all items are excreted out of your body on a regular basis. Blood iron regularization, creating homeostasis within the body. Okay, sodium potassium homeostasis, calcium homeostasis, chloride, chloride and phosphate homeostasis. Okay, creating a balance of this, not getting the body too alkaline or acidic in nature. Blood pH re re regulation. Okay, this is regulated by conserving bicarbonate iron and excreting uh, a lot of hydrogen iron. Okay. So hormone production, erythropoietin, which uh, which helps in the production of red blood cells, calcitrol, which helps in the homeostasis, homeostasis of calcium, regulating the calcium ions within the blood, and renin, blood pressure control. Okay, renin will um, will make sure uh, is the body in a state of edema or too much of water retention is going on or not. Okay. If too much of water retention is going on, the kidneys will start to filtrate more water out of the body. Okay, so renin will control the blood pressure as well. Blood volume regulation, adjusting the volume of the blood, depending upon the secretion of renin. Okay, if there is too much of blood volume, too much of blood volume, it will be, the kidneys will be functioning more to excrete out the excess water. So, uh, the blood volume will decrease from the body. And even in case of water retention within your body, when the body is undergoing swelling or edema, kidneys are working harder okay, to, to pull those water out of the body, access water out of the body. So these are the basic functions of kidney. Coming to the disease conditions. First is glomerulonephritis. Here, glomerulus, which we have discussed earlier, okay, which is present within the Bowman's capsule. Glomerulus, this is where the blood enters the kidney and blood is getting filtered. In the, in the glomerulus part, blood is getting filtered. Okay, so 
it is an inflammatory condition nephritis itis so it is an inflammatory process which happens it specifically in the glomeruli okay not not anywhere else not in the collecting ducts not in the bowman's capsule not any not anywhere else specifically in the glomerulus this inflammation will take it will take place okay this is where the small blood vessels uh, coil in the in the nephron globulus okay and it is most common in its acute form in children who are between 3 to 10 years of age it can happen in adults as well who have crossed the age of 50 and it is it uh, it is an acute condition it starts suddenly and it can uh, last only for a very short period of time and if uh, the recovery is not complete then it can lead to nephrotic syndrome in the future the most common causes of this inflammation is infections specifically streptococcal infection any uh, any other block uh, blocks like stone blocks or blocks in the kidney that could also lead to glomerulonephritis coming to the clinical signs and symptoms of glomerulonephritis loss of appetite shortness of breath irregular heartbeat chest pain chest pressure because of water too much of water retention within the body decreased urine output edema Hematuria, proteinuria. Hematuria means blood in urine. Proteinuria means protein in urine. Okay. So these are the situations that can take place as a symptom of glomerulonephritis. Oligouria as well. Oligouria means very, very less urination. And urea means absence of urination. Coming to the dietary management of people who suffer from glomerulonephritis, fluid intake on a daily basis should be about 500 ml. Again, this will be this. Uh, again, the dietary management uh, will be uh, taken care by the nephrologist as well. Okay, the nephrologist will recommend how much fluid has to be given to the, the glomerulonephritis patients on a daily basis. 500 ml is just a generalized statement, doesn't apply to anyone, like everyone. Okay. So, energy requirement 80 kilocalories per kg body weight will be fine. Okay. Protein requirement 20 to 40 gram per day. You have to cut down on the protein intake a little bit because the patient, if the specifically the, if the patient is suffering from protein urea, too much of protein in the urine. Okay, so you have to limit the protein intake, 20 to 40 gram per day. Calcium, 1 gram. It could be, it's, it should be more than 1 gram. Uh, yeah, uh, 1 gram, it's, it's almost uh, 1000 mg. Okay. Sodium, 500 to 1000 mg per day. You have to limit sodium a lot to so that water retention can be prevented. Can anyone guess what is the RTA of sodium for a healthy adult? It is more than 3000 mg. Okay, it, it is definitely more than 3000 mg. Not compulsory, it is 5 gram or 6 gram it, uh, because it depends on how much you're sweating. Okay, the kind of lifestyle you have if you are sweating a lot. Okay, if there is a lot of sweating uh, going on, uh, you your sodium intake has to be higher, approximately 6 gram and all. Okay, but if you are if you are having a very sedentary lifestyle, you are not sweating enough. Okay, there is not not much physical movement enough. At least three thousand mg you have to maintain. Okay, so here a person who is suffering from glomerulonephritis, five hundred to thousand mg gram per day. It should be less than one gram per day. Okay, sodium restricted diet has to be given. Potassium one milli more per kg uh, per day. Control the fruits. 
not all fruits can be given. Okay. Phosphorus intake 8 to 12 mg per kg per day. Phosphorus intake can be monitored using supplements as well. Okay. So sodium intake is restricted here in glomerulonephritis. Dietary protein may be may be increased when the protein is being lost in urine into like at, at a very high quantity quality. And if azotemia is present with dietary protein, uh, only then the dietary protein will be restricted. So it depends on what is the subjective case we are dealing with. Okay. If there is too much of protein lost in the in the urine protein intake has to be increased because we have to replenish the body with protein, okay? And if uh, if the person the person is suffering from azotemia, okay, uh, it, it means elevated level of urea and nitrogen in the blood, okay? When you do the blood test, high levels of urea and nitrogen is present in the blood. That is what we refer to as azotemia, okay? So if azotemia is present, only then dietary protein has to be restricted, okay? Because protein has the nitrogen, atom in it. If you see the structure of the protein carbon chain, it has nitrogen atom in it. So uh, in azotemia, already you have high nitrate levels. So to reduce it, you have to cut down on protein intake as well. So when the protein is restricted, complete protein such as meat, fish, eggs, soy, poultry, should be given. These supply all the essential amino acids required for the growth and tissue maintenance. Okay. So your, your protein source, specifically if it is from pulses, legumes, cereals, okay, or majority if it is from plant-based diet, you may have to modify your diet a little bit. Okay. Because already you are in a situation where protein is restricted. Okay. On top of that, you cannot afford a situation in which you lose out on your chance of having essential amino acid. So whatever protein-based uh, based food items you are allowed for in a, in a case of global nephritis are as follows. Okay. If you are non-vegetarian, meat, fish, eggs can work. Otherwise, if you are a vegetarian, so soy protein, tofu, okay, these can be given. Is it clear about glomerulonephritis, dietary management part, and what the condition is? Next is nephrotic syndrome. So in nephrotic syndrome, the another name of nephrotic syndrome is nephrosis. So it can be ca caused due to acute glomerulonephritis if it is not treated. Okay. It can turn into chronic glomerulonephritis and it leads to nephrosis. Okay. Nephrotic syndrome. Diabetes mellitus. High blood glucose levels from a very long time. Not able to control your blood glucose levels since a long time. Okay. Lupus erythe uh, erythematosus, this is lupus condition, autoimmune situation in which red blood cells are attacked. Amyloidosis, quantum malaria, okay, these are also due to, uh, because, because certain drugs that you take, okay. So in this condition, if it is untreated, it could lead to nephrotic syndrome or nephrosis. Okay, amyloidosis, uh, uh, amyloidosis means too much of protein in the diet that leads to buildup of protein or amino acids within the heart, kidney, liver and other organs. Okay, too much of protein intake could lead to amyloidosis. Coming to the clinical syndrome. So clinical, clinical symptoms of nephrotic syndrome, edema will be present. In lupus erythematosus, lupus is an autoimmune condition in which the body's own immunity will go and attack the red blood cells. Your own red blood cells. 
Lupus comes in different form. Okay. Lupus is basically an autoimmune condition. But in lupus, your immunity is overactive. It attacks its own body cells and tissues. So coming to the clinical symptoms of nephrotic syndrome, tachycardia, edema. Tachycardia means increased heart beat, heartbeat. Okay. Abnormal level of rise in your heartbeat. Usually for a healthy individual at, uh, in a resting situation, your heartbeat should be somewhere between 60, 65 to 100 beats per minute. Okay. If in, even when you're in a resting situation, your heartbeat is more than 120, etc. It is a matter of concern. Edema, edema means swelling that begins in the face. It can transgress into the entire body as well. Pale skin, fissures. Okay, uh, fissures means abnormal uh, cavity formation, tunnel formation between two tissue or organs. Hyperlipidemia, too much levels of lipid in the blood. Protein urea, protein present in urine. Too much of vomiting. So these all are the certain symptoms associated with nephrotic syndrome. Coming to the dietary management of nephrotic syndrome, protein is restricted hardly 0 0.8 to 1, 1 gram per kg. High carbohydrate diet has to be given here. Salt restriction is encouraged here as well. Moderate levels of fat is okay. And uh, fluid reten uh, retention will be there. So fluid is rest uh, restricted. Okay, the restricted amount of fluid will be somewhere around 500 ml per, uh, like per day. Something like that. Uh, it is not generalized fluid uh, fluid uh, um, uh, the quant quantity of fluid that you use is not generalized but somewhere around that range would be what is beneficial vitamin c and vitamin d supplementation will be beneficial then 2000 kilocalories on a daily basis Depends upon the uh, individual as well. Okay, if the individual is used to having thousand six hundred or seven hundred kilocalories per day, don't force the additional three hundred kilocalories. Okay. Kidney stones, if it is untreated, can lead to nephrotic syndrome as well. Any acute condition of the kidney, if it is untreated, it can lead to nephrosis or nephrotic syndrome. Okay. So is it clear about nephrotic syndrome and its dietary management? Next, we have renal failure. Renal failure is of two types, acute renal failure and chronic renal failure or chronic disease, disease. So in renal failure, as the name suggests, kidneys don't function at all or even if they're functioning, they're functioning at very extremely low capacity, which means the main function of the kidney is to filter the blood out, get rid of the toxic phase. So here the filtration is not taking place. The toxic phase are staying back in the body. So acute renal failure, it can occur, uh, occur suddenly, okay? Medical management has to be done. And chronic, which, uh, it, the when, when has the uh, symptoms begin, it, is, it will be difficult to say, okay? But some, some, some of the other acute symptoms and chronic symptoms may overlap. But when you were not successful to treat the chronic condition, sorry, acute condition, that it transgresses into chronic condition. So symptoms 
low vol uh, urine volume, either anuria or oligouria, accumulation of waste products or protein metabolism in the blood. Blood has to be filtered out, but it is the blood is full of toxins. High levels of uh, serum nitrogen and serum creatinine uh, levels is seen. The excretion of po uh, potassium is diminished, lack of ex excretion of potassium. The patient may feel very lethargic, anorexic, and su suffer from nausea and vomiting as well. So dehydration will also be there. Hypertension, oligouria, and anuria, these are the symptoms associated. So what are the treatment modalities we have? Either di dialysis, hemodialysis, where the blood is filtered out, or you can do the peritoneal dialysis. In peritoneal dialysis, uh, you just put a catheter inside the patient's stomach. An ostomy is already made. Okay. And then you use fluid to, uh, to pa pass through osmosis outside the body. Okay. So in that sense, So in that sense, um, in peritoneal dialysis, it can, it can be done at home as well. Hemodialysis, you have to go to the dialysis center and it can it has to be done. But for peritoneal dialysis, nurses or a trained professional will come to your house and they can get the peritoneal dialysis done. And it is uh, this fluid which you have inserted into the peritoneal cavity of the person, it has to stay there for some time as recommended by the manufacturer. And then the fluid will be taken out of the body. Causes of acute renal failure, pre-renal causes, that is, before the situation has been begun. Either there is a sudden uh, or severe drop in blood pressure, like a shock, interruption of blood flow to the kidneys from because of severe injuries, stones, okay. Uh, stones can also block the blood supply to the kidney. And then intra, intra renal direct damage to the kidneys is done because of inflammation, uh, toxins, drugs. It is not because of a blockage, because of a third party directly. Kidneys have become the target of this damage by inflammation, toxins, drugs, infection, or reduced blood supply. Post renal causes, such as sudden destruction or obstruction in urine flow because of UTI. Okay, uh, enlarged bladder or prostate that has not been surgically removed. Kidney stones, untreated kidney stones could lead to acute renal failure as well. Bladder tumor, malignant or benign. Any injury, okay, these all are associated with the causes of renal failure. Both acute and uh, chronic. Yesterday's recording is uploaded. Please check. Did others check yesterday's recording? Please mention in the chat box. Those who have checked yesterday's recording. So when you are opening the playlist, this is for everyone. These are the three main classification of causes that leads to renal failure. WhatsApp me or WhatsApp Dini ma'am with whom you are connected with. Is it Dini ma'am or is it me? Put a WhatsApp message to them. They will forward you the recorded sessions link. Yeah, you can turn on the notification as well. As soon as any new video is uploaded, you will get the notification. That's a good idea as well.
So these are the causes, okay? Uh, causes, renal causes, because of any other organs or because of any other injury or it's interruption that the blood supply is not reaching to the kidney, okay? That are the pre-renal causes. Intrarenal causes, some damage has happened inside the kidney to the kidney because of the uh, uh, because of this damage post renal causes something has ha something wrong has happened to the anatomical positioning beyond kidney okay like the urine flow in the ureter bladder urethra something blockage is happening in this downward part the bottom part of the urinary system that is the post renal causes okay is it clear to all the causes of acute renal failure Symptoms of acute renal failure. Again, decreased kidney function. Whatever hap wrong happens to the kidney, your filtration, blood filtration will come down. There will be edema, either blood in urine, protein in urine, reduced urine output, dehydration. Uh, if it is a tumor, you can detect an abnormal mass, pale skin, no appetite, poor appetite. Okay. How do you diagnose it that you are suffering from a kidney problem or issue or anyone else is suffering from a kidney issue? You have to do routine laboratory test, test the creatine levels, okay, and blood urea nitrogen levels. If these are high, if the creatinine levels and blood urea nitrogen levels are high, it suggests to some kidney problems. Ultrasound of the kidney can determine any tumors, any stones, okay, any other pathology can be detected. Kidney biopsy can be done if you are doubting it to be something cancerous. CT scan also can be done. Okay. So these are the diagnoses available. Coming to dialysis. Nutrition, uh, nutritional recommendation for uh, CKD, they have given in uh, on page number 461, a table is mentioned, okay. Treatment, please don't read it. Objectives of treatment, okay, don't read it. Symptoms, you can understand. What is acidosis? What is anemia? Okay. Acidosis means too much of, uh, like too much of hydrogen ions in your blood. Hydrogen ions are not getting filtered out. So, automatically the body turns out to be acidic. Okay, the blood tends out to be acidic, more acidic than normal. Okay. Treatments, objectives of treatment, medical treatment, pathological treatment, please don't read that. That is not under your syllabus. That is not under your practice. Then the amount of protein and everything that is calculated, it is calculated by the nephrologist, okay? But understand that the protein intake even in CKD is reduced 0 0.5 gram per kg body weight, okay? Which is very much reduced. Sodium is restricted, okay? The exact, exact detail of the dietary management it, 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 it is very much similar to all the other disc cases we have discussed. Protein restriction, salt restriction. If you are diabetic, if the person is diabetic, blood glucose level has to be normal. You have to bring it back to normal. Either through medications, diet, lifestyle. Water intake has to be monitored. So dialysis, you have two types of dialysis, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis is a common uh, one which when you hear about dialysis, this is what comes into your mind. The patient has to go to the dialysis center. Okay, Before dialysis be begins, a small surgery is done in which a fistula is made. Okay, Fistula means an op opening that connects the blood, uh, uh, blood and the artery and the vein okay so that a fistula, fistula operation has to be done on the patient wherever the dialysis needle has to be placed okay either on arm or on the groin 
So one needle will be, uh, there are two needles that are connect, connected from the dialyzer. Dialyzer, which you see here, this is called the artificial kidney. Okay. Dialyzer is part of your entire dialysis machine. This particular uh, situation here is called an artificial kidney. So two needles are used. One needle is uh, we will withdraw the blood out of the body. Okay. Uh, and this is arterial blood. Arterial blood has a lot of toxins. So this will take out the uh, arterial blood. It will undergo filtration outside the human body in the artificial kidney. Okay. And then clean blood, safe blood will be brought back and it will enter the venous veins. Okay. So is it clear how hemodialysis works? Is it clear to work to how, how an yeah, hemodialysis works? Okay. Now coming to peritoneal dialysis. So here a catheter, a small catheter will be inserted into the stomach. A small opening is already made okay, for this dialysis, peritoneal dialysis. Peritoneum, first, how frequently dialysis has to be done depends on the case. Certain progressive cases of CKD may require dialysis the every next day. Okay. Some patients require it on like the, every next day it has to be done. Okay. In some cases, twice a week is fine or thrice a week is fine. The frequency of dialysis is discussed, is decided by the nephrologist depending on the stage of the case, what they are finding. Okay. In peritoneal dialysis, there is a dialysis solution. You have to infuse this solution into the peritoneal cavity of the patient. Peritoneal cavity is where you contain all your intestines, your organs, okay, everything. So this dialysis uh, solution, what it does is that when it enters your peritoneal cavity, okay, this uh, an opening is already done surgically for this uh, catheter to be placed. Okay, so this small catheter, a soft tube, is surgically placed, placed through the abdominal uh, wall into the peritoneal cavity. It has to be kept clean. It has to be kept hygienic. Okay, then where uh, this dialysis solution, when it enters the peritoneal cavity, all these uh, dialysis fluids are poured into the area uh, for the dialysis to take place. It will be kept there for a few, few minutes. Okay. How long you have to keep it is uh, uh, like for different patient, this time period is different. Okay. How long this fluid will be kept depending on the situation. So when the fluids enter the peritoneal cavity, if you know what an osmosis is, okay. Uh, Osmosis or in what what happens is in osmosis is that things that are in higher concentration that will go into lower concentration. Okay, from higher concentration to lower concentration. So already the peritoneal cavity has a lost a lot of toxic waste, a lot of electrolytes. Okay, it is in high concentration. So all these electrolytes and toxic waste from high concentration will move out of the tissue, out of the organ, and it will get diluted in the dialysis solution. Okay, and then this dialysis, uh, dialysis solution, which is filled with toxic waste and unwanted electrolytes, okay, that will be drained out of the body. It has to be kept, uh, kept there usually for uh, four to five hours. Okay, uh, it depends on how long the patient requires the dialysis. That is decided by the nephrologist and the nurses who are the home nurses who visit, visit the patient will take care of this. Okay, so this is how the peritoneal dialysis is done. The entire technique is based on the concept of osmosis. Okay, movement of electrolytes from electrolytes based on any, any substance from higher concentration to lower concentration. Okay, when before uh, uh, this dialysis was done, the concentration of toxic waste and electrolytes was high in the body. 
okay and now the dialysis solution has come which does not have toxic waste does not have uh, any electrolytes it will pull out all these toxic waste from the entirety of your perito uh, uh, peritoneal organs okay it will uh, it and then it will be drained out of the body okay is it clear how peritoneal dialysis works Usually, one to three liters of uh, dialysis solution are used on an hourly basis. it will not clean all organs it will it will just take whatever is in higher concentration in our organ okay and it, and it brings down uh, brings down the organs ph into a homeostasis equilibrium okay it's not supposed to clean the organs as such cleaning the organs is a, is, is not the right word here we are aiming for homeostasis creating an equilibrium Which, uh, which dialysis has to be done is also decided by the nephrologist. It's based on the amount of toxicity the patient's body is pro producing. It, uh, here, the, here the blood value, blood is not, we are not concerned with blood because see, it is the peritoneal cavity. That is the peritoneal cavity. Okay, if the peritoneal cavity has blood, it means the patient is suffering from internal bleeding. Peritoneal cavity will not have blood. If the peritoneal cavity is filled with blood, means the patient is suffering from internal bleeding. Blood is supposed to stay inside the organs. Blood is supposed to stay, stay inside the blood vessels. Okay. urea creatinine levels okay these are all toxins that has to be removed from the body specifically urea level urea levels and creatinine levels this has to be removed from the blood whatever is in higher concentration in the blood has to be removed through dialysis techniques So hemodialysis will take only three to four, five hours of the treatment. Uh, uh, requires uh, uh, approximately three treatments on a weekly basis. Daily hemodialysis is not done. How many treatments is required? It is discussed by the nephrologist. Uh, uh, a fistula has to be created surgically with, uh, before you start the hemodialysis. And also it's very expensive because the hospital has to make sure that their water is of a specific quality, okay? Any hospital cannot create a dialysis center. First, the hospital has to get certified that it, it can produce a specific quality of water, okay? The water which is used for dialysis, okay, it has to be, it requires a complex treatment, okay? It is expensive. And the people, the staff whom you, uh, higher for the dialysis ward. They all has to be skilled in the di skilled dialysis technician as well. Hepan uh, is also given to the patients who undergo hemodialysis, and the patient is confined in this in this room until and unless the entire dialysis procedure is done. The patient is confined. So three to four hours or five hours, how much however long it takes. For hemodialysis to be done, the patient has to stay there. 
when it comes to peritoneal dialysis, it can be performed very quickly, immediately. It does not require any complex equipment. Okay, it is not expensive at all. Uh, a regular nurse can also carry out this peritoneal dialysis treatment. Okay, uh, you don't require a dialysis technician for this. Heparin is used in very small am amount. Heparin is an anticoagulant. It will not allow your blood to form clots. And it, uh, some patients who are getting peritoneal dialysis on a regular basis, they can do this on their own. They don't require the help of a medical aid here. And it can it allows the patient to be independent as well. They can do their own activities. They, they, they just have to hang this pouch, okay? And they can carry on with their activities for the next two to three hours, okay? It, they are not confined in a room or a bed for this entire dialysis to take place. And the, and the patient can be a bit more liberal with their diet. They don't have too much of restriction, like sodium restriction, potassium restriction, protein restriction. These many restrictions are not there with peritoneal dialysis diet. So dietary management. So energy requirement, 35 kilocalories per kg body weight. It's generalized, okay. Protein requirement, 1.1. 1.3 gram per kg body weight if the dialysis is going on you can you can increase your protein intake salt 3 to 4 gram per day almost very equivalent to a healthy uh, a normal individual water it is according to the urine output on a monthly basis whenever you get the nephrologist visits done they will tell let you know how much water you can you have to reduce or how much more you can add All this information is given on page uh, page number 468, table 20.8. You can refer that nutritional requirement during the various stages of renal failure. We have discussed acute renal failure and chronic renal failure. Okay, in or different stages of renal failure, what what is the nutritional uh, nutritional management or dietary management required to be done is mentioned there. Kidney patients, they kidney patients go for peritoneal dialysis. Why you do dialysis? Because the kidney is not able to filter the waste properly. That is the reason why you, you have to do peritoneal dialysis. Definitely kidney patients have to go for peritoneal dialysis. Next is kidney stones. So kidney stones can take place anywhere in the urinary system, okay? So again, I'm repeating, choosing between the two, hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis depends on the patient's disease condition, what stage they are, okay? And what kind of kidney disease they are suffering from. Based on that, is this choice made? If the choice is not made by the patient, it is made by the nephrologist for the well-being of the patient. So kidney, st uh, kidney stones, or, or it is called as urinary calculi, okay? It can take place in the kidney, urethra, uh, urethra ureter, bladder, okay? Any any part of the uh, urinary system uh, can, can be obstructed by the kidney stones. So there are four different types of kidney stones. Calcium stones are the most common one. Then we have uric acid stone, strew white stone, and cysteine stone. Okay, it depends upon your diet, what kind of diet, uh, you, uh, what, which type of diet you are having that determines what kind of kidney stone you are diagnosed with. Risk factors of kidney stones, it is genetic, runs in the family. People who are overweight, those who don't drink enough water, okay, the, those who are on medication, specifically calcium gluconate, gluconate medications uh, for a very long period of time can have a high risk of developing kidney stones. Foods, okay, we'll discuss about the foods later because uh, it, it is based, the diet that you prescribe 
for kidney stone. It is largely based on the diet as well. So what are the symptoms of kidney stones? There will be severe pain in the one, one side, on the waist, okay, and the lower back. You can see here, they have marked which part of the body is affected by the kidney stone pain. And this is a colicky pain. Colicky pain means a sudden pain which travels towards the groin. Okay, it may start here, sudden pain, it may start in the sides, uh, the sides near the waist or the lower back and it travels towards your groin. Okay, so that, that kind of colic, sharp, sudden pain is what the patient suffer from. Frequent, uh, like urination, it will be very painful, uh, high chance of urinary infection, blood in urine, if the stone is eroding the tissues of the urinary tract. Frequent urge to urinate, but there is no urination. Okay, passing small amounts of urination only, even how your urge is high. These are the symptoms of kidney stones. In warm climate, the urine volume is low, so high chance of um, kidney stones are seen in people who reside in the hot states of India, like. Rajasthan, Saurashtra, Saurashtra is in Gujarat, the Gujarat area, okay, North Gujarat area, Punjab side. Okay. This is related to high heat, high the, the heat in the climate as well as water scarcity. Occupation, people who work directly under the sun and who sweat a lot, okay, they are also at the high risk of developing urinary stones, kidney stones. Infection, recurrent infection of your urinary tract can lead to stone as well. Dietary habits, consuming food that are that have too much of oxalates, calcium, purines, phosphate, okay, that would lead to renal cancer. Right? Too much of tea consumption, okay, having too much of tea, eating diet that is uh, that is high in sodium, uh, fat, meat, sugar, low fiber. Okay, and you uh, eat more vegetable protein, unrefined uh, carbohydrate. This can also increase the risk of renal stones. Runs in the family as well. Gender, it is more common in males as compared to females. So types of renal stones, calcium stones, uric acid stones, White stones and cysteine stones. Majority of the uh, uh, urinary stones are calcium phosphate and calcium oxalate stones. In India, it is the calcium oxalate stone which is most common. Coming to the treatment part of it. Acid ash diet and alkaline ash diet is prescribed. Okay. So, like when the stones are made up of calcium or magnesium phosphate or carbonates, the urine is more basic in nature. Okay. The entire body is more alkaline in nature. So, we want to make it more acidic. We want to, uh, we want to add more acidic food into the diet so that to to, to create that equilibrium okay so acid ash diet means you give this specific diet struvite so stones happen because of recurrent urinary tract infection it is made up of ammonia that is produced by the bacteria and the epithelial cells okay that, that is produced by the human okay that is mixed and that it, for, it forms two white stones happens with recurrent uti infections so acid ash food is given when the when you have stones which are made up of calcium and magnesium commonly seen in indian uh, indian population So the pH of this acidite diet should be between 4.5 to 5. 
and if it if you are giving the patient alkaline ash diet if the if the, the, the patient has uric acid stones okay you have to give them alkaline ash diet so for that the ph is between 7.6 to 8 okay so you have you are creating an equilibrium here if the urine is more basic in nature not acidic at all you you give acid push uh, acid food if the uh, urine is very concentrated high rate of urinary acid the, the urine is very acidic in nature, you give alkaline ash diet, okay? So acid ash diet, these are the examples, meat, uh, fish, selfish, and eggs, or the dairy and other proteins, peanut butter, uh, nuts, like walnuts, brazil nuts, all type of whole wheat, okay? Cereal, spaghetti, noodle, rice, Vegetables like corn and lentils can be given. Fruits like cranberry, plums, fruits, more citric fruits. Okay. Coming to the alkaline ash food. If the stones are uric acid stones or cysteine stones, cysteine is protein stones. Okay. Alkaline ash diet is given. And uh, the alkaline producing food like milk, milk products, butter milk, okay, almonds, uh, chestnuts, coconuts, vegetables like be uh, beetroots, greens, all the dark green leafy vegetables are basic in nature. Okay, spinach, turnip greens, fruits, uh, 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 all the fruits can be given except for the more citrusy ones like cranberries, plum, and prunes. They are very citrusy in nature. That has to be uh, uh, avoided. You can notice here in alkaline ash food, we are not giving any non-vegetarian food. If it is an acid ash diet, non-vegetarian food can be included. See, when you are having an acidic ash diet, green leafy vegetables, dark green leafy vegetables have to be avoided. Okay, because it has a lot of oxalate. Usually, acid ash, uh, acid ash diet is given for calcium oxalate, magnesium oxalate, phosphate uh, stones. So, naturally, all the green leafy vegetables will be taken out. But when you are, you are giving alkaline ash diet, it's not because of oxalates and phytates and phosphates the stones have formed. The stones have formed because of uric acid, cysteine. Okay, so here you can indulge more in oxalate-rich food like spinach and all. Understood? So this, this here you can see high oxalate rich foods and low oxalate rich food. In Indian scenario, in Indian scenario, majority of the uh, Indian population suffers from calcium oxalate stone. Okay. So all these food, if, if only if they're suffering from calcium oxalate food, this has to be avoided, okay? High oxalate rich food has to be avoided. Potatoes, yams, legumes, beans, seeds, nuts, wheat, bran, soy, tofu, miso, raspberry, spinach, Swiss chard, beetroots, chocolates, processed meats, pumpkin, eggplant, the brinjal, grapefruit, and juice. Low oxalate food like coffee can be given, low fat diary, bananas, cantaloupe, papaya, all the green uh, greens like broccoli, iceberg lettuce, capsicum, water with lemon can be given here. So prevention. And acid or uh, alkaline ash diet is not the only solution of treating st uh, stones that have already formed, but in the future to prevent this, it is better. Okay, to remove the stones, you may have to go through short term wave therapy or surgery, or your intake of water should be high. 
okay so that some some stones can pass you, you can urinate some stones on its own if it is too small tiny ones okay others you have to use shock wave therapy uh, so short wave therapy to uh, uh, to smash the, those stones within the kidney without causing any harm in the soft tissues and when you urinate all these smashed stones will pass out of the body through urination So foods that are rich in calcium, phosphates, or, or, or oxalates, and purine on table 20.11, page number 473. Those who have the textbook, page number 473, you can refer this table to understand which food has high calcium level, high phosphate, oxalate, and purine level. And accordingly, whatever kind of stone the patient has been diagnosed with, these specific food items can be excluded from their diet. Okay. So this is a just uh, just a vegetarian plate for, plate for kidney stones, calcium oxalate stone specifically, because in Indian population we see a lot of calcium oxalate stone. Okay, other forms of stones are very rare in Indian population. So uh, you can refer this as a foundation for create, creating a diet plan for a calcium oxalate stone diagnosed patient. Okay. So the nephrologist will approve the foundation of your diet plan. Substitutions and food exchange you can use on your own 